Welcome. This is the inaugural um, live stream. I'm using a Mevo camera. This is the first time I've ever done something like this. I have my iPad, but I also have this pile of books to talk about. And right behind it, I've also got my trusty little drink. It's going to help keep me um, not too parched during this, but here we go. Here's what I was planning on doing tonight. I have had the good fortune of going around speaking at different churches or youth groups or just different gatherings. And one of the things that I've noticed is a fair number of people, well, there seems to be two reactions. Either one, people seem to really enjoy what I'm saying, or people tend to ask like, is this guy even Christian at all anymore? But the thing is, I think, one of the things that sets me apart is I have done an enormous amount of reading and that's not necessarily a compliment. That's just the fact that I'm a massive nerd about theology and philosophy and church history. However, it's led me to read a lot of different books than what seems to be in the popular mainstream church world. And you might be able to notice, let's zoom in again. Um, some of these books, you might not even know about. However, some of them, let's see, which one's the oldest? Probably this one is the oldest. Then probably this one. Then probably this one. But regardless, it's important to pay attention to what things have influenced you, what things have really grabbed your attention. So what I would like to do is literally go through this whole pile. And this pile is really not in order of importance. I just decided to stack them in alphabetical order so as to not show too much favoritism towards one or the other. Because in all honesty, I have referenced most of these books casually because they've become so much a part of me. So what I would like to do is, uh, let me put this down. Grab a sip. We're just gonna have a, we're just gonna have a chat. Hopefully, it'll be just a good time. So, I was born and raised in the church, and I have since had a massive amount of respect for the whole breadth and width and depth of the tradition. I think most people don't even realize that Christianity has got an enormous amount of wisdom and truly brilliant insights about life and ethics and philosophy. And most of these things are barely even scratched, not even looked upon. So let's begin. In no primary order, we are going to start with Karl Barth. He wrote this book called Evangelical Theology, an Introduction. Now, this is his swan song. This is the last book he ever wrote. And it was the first book from him that I ever read. However, I referenced, I referenced things from this book every so often. But really, this book is symbolic of the rest of his work, 
which I have also read pretty much the entirety of Church Dogmatics, which is a 14 or 15 volume set that's, it was called the greatest piece of theological writing since Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, uh, the Psalm of Theology. So this one is fantastic because he breaks it down, his general perspective and worldview according to different themes. And they seem to be themes that are really quite uh, reasonable. And I think most of Bart's work is just completely misunderstood, in part because people don't really read him in his entirety. They take, just like the news today, they take sound clips and react or respond to just the sound clips. So this first one, Evangelical Theology, Karl Barth really influenced me. And if I were to say anything about what are his greatest contributions to me, would probably be two. One, his emphasis on Trinity, which then he uses to expound the rest of his understanding of the doctrine of God. Most people start with God and then work their way to talk about Trinity. He starts with Trinity and then he, he builds a whole framework off of that. And then second, uh, he really likes the formula of Chalcedon or the Chalcedonian Creed, however you want to pronounce it. The Chalcedonian Creed has got this one line that's really quite remarkable because it takes um, the Nicene Creed and expands upon a middle part of it. The Nicene Creed has got a section about the incarnation with Jesus. And the Chalcedonian Creed, in some sense, is like a, a fuller exposition of that, where he says, or uh, the Chalcedonian Creed says, that the two natures of Jesus exist without confusion or division, separation or change. Um, I think that's close to the order, but that's the most important phrase for me. That we often think of life in two polar opposites. We have like the left and the right, inclusive, exclusive, Republican, Democratic, like, right? But also these odd paradoxes of like divinity and humanity, we tend to think in either ors, but actually these two things are quite close to each other, right next to each other. Does that make sense? Because these, all these things that we separate into polar opposites, we've got to put them right next to each other and understand them as intricately close without confusion, division, separation, or change, just like the incarnation. So the Christianity that I kind of have gleaned from him is that we often do either or thinking. And we've got to find a way to not be dialectical, but in some sense kind of unitive and holding the tensions together as closely as we can. So that is a brilliant insight. Next up, we got Bonaventure. Now this is a collection of the soul's journey into God, the tree of life and the life of St. Francis. Um, Bonaventure was a contemporary of Thomas Aquinas. They both taught at the University of Paris and they taught theology there. Um, but one of the things that's most important about him is that he was a Franciscan. And so he was in the line of St. Francis. He was a part of the same movement, came into leadership of the Franciscan movement a couple positions after uh, St. Francis. But we actually have one of the best biographies of St. Francis as a result of Bonaventure. Now, Bonaventure does something fascinating, is that he does not just theology. When he was at the university in Paris, they were kind of expected to integrate the disciplines as best as they could. And so his most brilliant piece is called The Soul's Journey into God, where he has taken multiple disciplines and shoved them all together and said, Theology is quite encompassing of all of these things. Now, he does build on Augustine, where at one point he says, there's three ways by which we come to know God. Through the world without, through the world within, and then through the world above. And that's what the soul's journey into God is all about. It's a beautiful treatise. I actually wrote two papers for it on uh, for my master's degree at Princeton. And... It's just a refreshing alternative way that mixes theology and spirituality and Trinity so deeply. And uh, I think I probably should say 
Bonaventure is one of the first figures who really synthesized theology and Christian spirituality or mysticism right next to each other. That there can be deep theology as well as deep experience. And that was one of the best takeaways I got from Bonaventure. Here we go. Next up, we got Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. This is considered a classic. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor during World War II who was eventually killed by the Nazis at, in a concentration camp. He wasn't quite hung. We actually think he was strangled by wire that was fed through a wall and choked him out, let him think he was dying, and then he would come back and then they'd choke him again. It was just horrific. However, in the midst of all of that, Leading up to that day when he was killed by the Nazis, he wrote this book, which is understood as one of the best and most formative books explaining the Sermon on the Mount and how it is the call of every Christian to actually really submit to the Sermon on the Mount. I read this book probably at first when I was 23, and I would sit in my backyard down at the beach, and I remember being a good Lutheran, having a beer in one hand, and cost of discipleship in the other, and I was just reading, uh, like a good Lutheran, this fantastic Lutheran uh, martyr, if you want to say that. But he has some brilliant lines in here, especially in his chapter about uh, loving your enemy. And when you understand the context of World War II, you understand that he was writing for a very momentous time in history and so for him to write a chapter about what he calls enemy love is just staggering so that would be the cost of discipleship if you don't even read the whole thing i would probably say the first five chapters of this book are absolutely worth your time definitely worth the price of the entire book but if you go beyond the first five chapters it will challenge you in wonderful and difficult ways next up we're still in the bees <laughs> For authors. Uh, Walter Brueggemann is a, a current scholar. He's a, a Christian scholar, but he focuses on the Old Testament. And so he's got some really remarkable insights about the Hebrew world and everything else. But this is understood as probably one of the best books that's ever been written about what it means to be prophetic. It's barely the thickness of your pinky. But honestly, every single sentence is that packed with as many good things as you could possibly get. And in this one, he really did show to me that the role of a prophet is to preach for a different kind of world to come into being. And that there's something subversive at all times going on with the prophets. Prophets are always trying to challenge the status quo but they do it in very unique and sometimes even artistic ways and poetic ways, if at that. So starting with Moses, he sees as, as a, a prophetic figure. He then eventually gets to Jesus, but my goodness, there are so many good things in here. And he does contrast, I think it's, he calls it the, the royal consciousness is very different from the prophetic consciousness the way that royalty or let's change the word the way that those who run politics go about doing leadership is very different from what the prophets would have because the prophets see right through what their royal consciousness is trying to do and if anything the prophets are often writing songs of liberation and rebellion saying that things can be better and those in political power don't seem really interested in improving the status quo but the prophetic imagination is always about imagining a world that could be without trampling on other people so this is man this is fantastic this says uh, i don't even know what the price of this one is but it's amazing it really is Next up, we have a completely misunderstood heretic. <laughs> I really do think so. So this is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He's a French Jesuit 
who obviously lived in France, but he also had a background in paleontology and I believe geology. And he, he started writing these pieces where he was trying to synthesize Christianity and evolution together. And he was hitting a lot of pushback. He was actually writing, I think, during the First World War, Second, and then the 50s, and that, I believe he died in the 60s. But he was probably ahead of his time in a lot of ways. He probably is one of those people that was so misunderstood that it led him to actually have a rather sad life. He was essentially banished from France, sent to go live in China, and then from there he moved to New York City, and all the while producing these publications where he was hoping people could listen to some of his ideas, but in obedience to the church that he committed himself to, he, he, he never published. Until after his death, his secretary had a note saying that she was allowed to publish all of his works, and so that's where we have this. But his most famous book is called The Divine Milieu. Milieu means environment or surrounding. And in here, he's trying to say that God soaks the entire environment that we find ourselves. There's really no such thing as profane or sacred, according to him. In some sense, it all matters on how you're using it. And it's really quite Jesuit of him to say everything can be used for your spiritual development, nourishment, or diminishment. And so for him, he does this really incredible thing at redefining, seriously, redefining Christian spirituality in a universe that's still evolving. Now, this isn't a strict theological piece. Yeah, there's a lot of theology in it. But there's, it's sprinkled with prayers from him that sound like they're from his own journals. And it's really nothing more than him trying to understand what does it look like to have a faith in a universe that's still evolving and still growing and still blossoming. For him, the Christian faith is something that really is for the purpose of human growth. And that everything, everything is headed towards this great omega point. And that's a call out to the Bible where it says that God is the alpha and the omega. The starting point and the finish. And that God is drawing all things up into higher consciousness, love, and intentional communion with God. But... When you read the book, you can't think about a Christian is a Christian alone. A Christian is a Christian who lives in existence with everything else in the cosmos. And so it's not just the Christian that's being summed up and gathered up into the Omega that is God, but actually all of creation is being dragged into conscious, unitive love with God. And for him, Christ is really the reconciling principle and the universe. And so Christ is in some sense, the pull of evolution that in Christ, God is pulling everything back into him. So this is a remarkable book. Karl Barth said really negative things about him. I think they called him a Gnostic snake, but I, I'm not sure if that's really the fairest example. I just believe he's really misunderstood, but he says so many good things about making sure that we realize the things that cause us to grow and the things that cause us to diminish. Um, there's ways of looking at all of life as though it's a, a spiritual thing. So that's remarkable. He's constantly referenced as a, a cosmic mystic, that he has a Christian faith that really, truly is concerned with the whole of the cosmos, just not not just an individual person. Next up, we got Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila. And I think I've read this book three times straight through and referenced numerous parts. This is the second time I've bought this. 
The earlier time was with a different translation, but this one's by Mirabai Star. Interior Castle completely changed the way I understood uh, the interior journey. What does it mean like to have a, a spiritual life that's deep and that in, it's kind of like um, concentric circles. In fact, that's actually the front right there. That all of us need to understand ourselves as like a castle. And there's rooms that we have to go through in order to get to the heart of the castle. And so for her, this really kind of the medieval process she wrote in the 1600s really truly sought to reform the Catholic Church of her day because it needed it and she realized it. But she um, wrote this, this wonderful piece. It's really quite vulnerable, but really also is steeped in humility and recognizing the need for self-knowledge. Um, there's a beautiful section in here about how every one of us are kind of like a butterfly that's slowly blossoming that there are stages of being like a caterpillar and then going into a cocoon, being dissolved down and then emerging forth as a butterfly. So there's so much about the wisdom of transformation in here. And there's a lot of talk about God as the beloved. You could tell that she probably read the book Song of Songs quite a bit. Now, most people understand the Christian faith in the sense of like innocence and guilt or guilt and forgiveness, but actually she sees it very much as a, a love affair with God. And that every one of us need to do what is necessary to cultivate a beautiful soul. And to do that, she uses this analogy um, that came to her in a vision about seeing your inner soul as like a diamond castle. So this one has definitely shaped my theology because really what it's done is shown me Good theology is actually for the purposes of doing good spirituality. And that's a very different thing. Some people are very prone to staying in dense theology and never getting around to the vulnerability or the, um, the closeness that's supposed to happen in spirituality. So she's one of my favorite uh, Christian mystics, hands down. If you read this book and you really slowly chew on it, it will probably shock you. No lie, I read this once. I started doing a reread of it and I started tearing up on the second page. Yeah. So when someone who's like me, like an Enneagram five reads a page that causes me to tear up, you know, that's a big deal. Here we go. Let's keep going. We are halfway. Next up we got silence by Shusaku Endo. This is a narrative. This isn't really a, a theology or philosophy book, although it does touch on some very deep themes and ideas. I know someone who rereads this every Lent and sometimes reads a, or teaches a class on it, who is uh, the grandson of a Japanese pastor. <laughs> but it's about two Jesuit priests during, I think, I believe it's the 1700s. I got to look at it again. But they go to Japan to try to find their mentor, who there was a rumor that their mentor gave up the faith. And so they're worried for their friend, so they go in search of him, who, their, who was their favorite mentor and teacher. But while they're there, they're uh, confronted with an enormous amount of persecution. The Japanese government really didn't want any more European influence. And as a result, sought to cut out uh, Christianity. And in the midst of that, they're presented with this very deep question. You ready? Would you give up your faith if it meant those people over there would stop being tortured? That's it. Because the mentor, their teacher supposedly gave up the faith, gave up Christianity, which is a big deal for a Jesuit priest, obviously, to give up Christianity. However, they did it out of love of neighbor where the Japanese government was just torturing a whole town. And so here's the question, yes or no, is it Christ-like to deny yourself for the benefit of other people? 
there's this odd and strange passage in, I, I believe it's Romans 9, where Paul says that he would love to be, um, I think he says pretty much damned to hell just so that the rest of the Israelites, his Jewish friends, would come to know God uh, in Christ. And so what ends up happening, and I won't say what happens, uh, the two priests are confronted with the same issue. Yes or no, will they give up Christianity if it meant that the Japanese government will stop torturing a whole town over there? This is one of those books. It doesn't leave you feeling triumphant, but it does leave you with this understanding that um, there is no room for spiritual ego or pride in the Christian faith. The two priests go to Japan and you find out rather quickly that they are very arrogant and that they kind of look down on other people without realizing that they are just as weak as everyone else. And it was written by Shusaku, who, while was Japanese, had a European faith. He was a Christian. And this was written relatively recently, so it's historical fiction. But this is actually his way of wrestling with the fact that he was Japanese, yet had a European faith. And yet when he would go to Europe to visit, he didn't feel like he fit in because he was Japanese. So this really is a remarkable book. And uh, maybe it's less about theology. No, no, it still is. But it's definitely about those hard paradoxes that invite you into like, maybe the faith is way more complex and beautiful than we realized. So this is Silence by Shusaku Endo. Abraham Joshua Heschel is probably my favorite Jewish theologian or author. And this was his PhD um, text. This is what he wrote. This was his dissertation that I believe he then tweaked and rewrote um, into a book. This is a great book. Hands down, um, the price of the book the introduction is worth the price of the book. The introduction alone and his definition of what it means to be a prophet is striking. It's just fantastic and it, it really highlights that the prophet is pained by the same things that God is pained by and constantly walks around curious why other people aren't pained by the same pains that they experience. Does that make sense? But he does something really remarkable in here is that he makes the the Jewish faith quite relatable and he asks like a good rabbi some very deep questions and my favorite one which I really have referenced quite a bit is are we no no is God anthropopathic which means does God have human emotions or are we theopathic do we experience God-like emotions and that's that's a, a brilliant switch because in the Bible, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the passages that show God as having emotion and sometimes being overrun by emotion. God gets angry. God gets jealous. God gets um, furious. And we're like, this, this shouldn't be God. However, that just shows that we're more influenced by Greek understandings of God, that maybe the Aristotelian view that God is static. But when he goes on and he says, no, 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 it's backwards. It's we who are theopathic. We actually experience godlike emotions. Just we maybe experience them out of order or disorder. So he really does something fantastic just in that chapter. But everything else he says in here is really remarkable. And if you were to go online and you type up um, segregation par parades or marches, often you'll see pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. with his arms linked. And often Heschel is linked arms with him because Heschel was in a lot of those protests as well. He's the guy there with his gigantic goatee and his curly white hair. Just a remarkable figure. It would have been uh, an absolute treasure to have sit and talked with him, especially when he writes such brilliant tomes as this, The Prophets. Check that one out too. 
Oh, yeah. And you can't get anywhere without Soren Kierkegaard, right? So Soren Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher in the early 1800s. And this is probably, mm, there's two books I had to choose from the, for this pile. So, but the two books that really have influenced me the most are this. Purity of Heart is the Will One Thing and uh, Works of the Law. Or, no, Works of Love. Sorry, I said it wrong. Um, but this book, I read it with another friend, Chris, and it was, this just shocked us. This was like the first foray into not just theology, but like philosophy and ethics. And this whole book is taken from James 1, where it talks about double-mindedness. And the word for mind in Greek is suke, which can mean soul. So this book is very much about being double-souled. When you have a split soul because you've got split motives because you're actually caring about two things with duplicity of heart rather than one thing with, with purity of heart. And it, it is a hard read. It's not an easy one. But it really highlights the fact that the Christian really needs to examine their internal motives as often as they can and make sure that they're doing things for the proper reasons. If you get the title of the book, Purity of Heart is the Will One Thing, then you understand the whole book. But if you read the book, then you'll really understand the title. Because in the chapters, let's look at this. He goes into... Uh, Barriers to willing one thing. Um, variety and great moments are not one thing. That we need to be aware of the reward disease, of doing good for the purpose of being rewarded. We need to be careful because that means we're being duplicitous. We don't really love the good. We just love the good and we want to be rewarded. Or there's, you might love the good, but you also do the good because you fear punishment for not doing the good. And there's also questions of how committed to the good do you have to be? Should you die for the good? Should you break other laws for the sake of the good? And is that really loving the good if you're willing to break good in order to make good happen? See what I mean? Like Kierkegaard was so good at taking issues and making them more complex to have to deal with. He was so good at that. And he wasn't quite appreciated in his day. He was actually kind of seen as a loud mouth and he often wrote under a pseudonym, but he did say that the day is coming where people will want complexity rather than simplicity. So this is a fantastic book. I actually gave my original copy away to someone else and uh, I saw a brand new copy of it. So I had to get it and I have to reread this at some point soon. Um, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Purity of heart is the will one thing. Oh yeah, Thomas Merton. This guy probably is the I don't know if he's the most influential writer in my uh, worldview from the 1900s or not, but he's definitely up there. He's probably in like a three-way tie with four other people. Um, that's not how you say that. Three-way tie with four other people. Anyways, Thomas Merton. I chose just to sh highlight this one, No Man is an Island, because this book uh, was my first foray into Thomas Merton. And the very first chapter is called Love Can Be Kept. But actually, it's Love Can Be Kept Only by Being Given Away. And when I read that book, when I first read that chapter, it dropped my jaw. And when I got my first iPhone, this was one of the first books I actually bought on Kindle to make sure I carry it with me at all times. Now, I still prefer the hardback. I still prefer to be able to look and see. Um, I reread this book sometimes with a different color pen because I like to see what stood out to me each time I've read it. Um, but this got me kickstarted on a Thomas Merton fixation where I then have gone on to read my goodness, probably close to a dozen or more other books. And I've even been to Our Lady of Gethsemane, the abbey down in Kentucky where he lived and where he wrote. But he had this 
uh, Jim Finley calls it the deathless wisdom of God, that Thomas Merton, while being so steeped in prayer for himself, found a way to write in the tradition of the timeless, deathless wisdom of God. And so there's actually some figures from church history that if you read them, they, yes, it's them talking, but it's almost as though their words are so profound that it, it sounds so truthful and loving and precise that you're like, that is the same exact wisdom or voice as Athanasius from North Africa from the 300s. Or it sounds like Augustine, or it sounds like Bonaventure, it sounds like all of these figures. There's a timelessness to the wisdom in this book that I can see that this one will be read for a long time. And if anything, most of these books, I believe will stand the test of time if they haven't already. And if you're going to be shaped by anything, why not be shaped by the books that are timeless and have something of a connection to the deathless wisdom of God that will never die, but instead will be reborn and find a new voice in every generation. So I'm not sure if you could say this is theology or even, I guess, it's spirituality, but uh, this book is one of those books where I would say it's probably inspired with a, with a lowercase i. We like to say the scripture is inspired, sure, but I would say scripture was inspired with a capital I. This was inspired with a lowercase I. And it's it should be in the canon of every Christian. Everyone should have a copy of this and read it and get to know it very well. So, two more. This one is the Enneagram, a Christian perspective by Richard Rohr and Andreas Ebert Ebert. Um, I chose this one for two reasons. One, it was my first book I believe I read from Richard Rohr that deeply impacted me. I previously read um, Breathing Underwater, his synthesis of the 12 steps from the AA um, in spirituality. I read that one. It didn't settle with me. Maybe I wasn't ready for it. And then I did read Eager to Love and then something else. But then this one, Eager to Love, actually introduced me to Bonaventure. Eager to Love is a great one about Franciscanism. But this mm, shocked me into the necessary transformations that I need to do. And more than that, it helped to show me that all of us have necessary transformations to do. Now, that's important for my own personal theology because... Um, being raised Lutheran, there's certainly an emphasis on like you're guilty and you need to be redeemed or given forgiveness. That's fine. However, all of that happens for a, a larger purpose. You're forgiven for the purpose of being transformed. You're forgiven for the purpose of conscious union, conscious loving union with God. So forgiveness is fine, but if you stop there, then you'll never get around to transformation and you'll never get around to being in conscious, loving union with God. So Roar, in some sense, he is kind of close to a merchant figure for our day. There is a bit of a deathless wisdom to some of his writings. Uh, I believe that some of his writings are certainly beneficial for people, and I think he's often misunderstood in some sense because he knows the tradition and he's simply quoting what people have already said. It's just that most of us don't know what the church has already said. So that's that. But I also thought this was a good one because this was the first book I read on the Enneagram. I believe this is the third copy of this that I've bought because I read one, I gave it to somebody, they never gave it back, I forgot who it was. And then that happened again. So I think this is the third time I've bought this book for myself and reread it. But I believe the Enneagram is probably one of the best um, tools to assist Christian transformation. You shouldn't be preaching the gospel of the Enneagram. You should be preaching the gospel of the unconditional love of God that 
God in love and freedom chose to say yes to all of humanity in Jesus, that's good news. But if you want a good tool for personal reflection to see your own gifts and your own curses for, that exist for your own personality, the Enneagram is a great place to start. And this probably kick-started my fixation on reading as many books as I can about the Enneagram. Uh, I think I'm upwards now of like nine or ten books I've read on it. So I am a terrible, terrible nerd. All right. But check that one out because in some sense, if you want to think about the theology of this, it's kind of saying that there is there is a way to meet people where they are. And if you want to know how to love your neighbor well, you have to understand how your neighbor might operate. And we all know that's the second greatest commandment. The first is love God, and the second is love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to love your neighbor, you have to know how they're programmed. How is it that they go about their life? What are their favorite ways of playing the game of life? And more than that, um, you could say every single one of us have a conscious duty and calling to decrease the suffering in the world. And the way to do that is to know how you perpetuate your own suffering and diminish that. Because if you can diminish your suffering, your own pain, your own hurt that you cause yourself, then you're not going to then pass it on and lash out at other people. So you can love your neighbor by doing your own work so that you don't lash out and hurt other people. And then from there, you can help to diminish the suffering in the world when you understand how they work and how they work against their own self and how you can maybe help other people when they're ready help heal themselves. So in some sense, the Enneagram is really nothing more than a, a brilliant wisdom about how to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. But that's Roar. Roar has also been a fantastic person to get to know, and, and I've had a good fortune of getting to meet up with him a few times. All right, last up. Um... All of these previously are Christian or Jewish writers. Ken Wilber, I believe, identifies as Buddhist, but he wrote this fantastic book called The Religion of Tomorrow. It is something close to like 800 pages, 700 something. Um, but it's called The Religion of Tomorrow because he saw that the great traditions of the world are all shrinking in attendance and devotees. Uh, Europe is at 11% church rate, and most of the world seems to be moving away from religion. But what he does is actually say there is a place for religion because there is no other discipline or sphere of life that is solely committed to the purpose of helping people to wake up, grow up, clean up, and show up to their own life. He says religion has a unique place in that. No other discipline highlights all four of those things of saying you need to wake up to the reality that everything around you is spiritual you need to grow up you need to clean up you need to fix yourself up um wake up grow up oh grow up sorry growing up would just be the sense that you have a maturation process and if you don't take it upon yourself to actually grow and fully blossom to who you all can be then no wonder religion has got so many people leaving it because it doesn't help people to grow up. People can also maintain their little ego identities and stuck, be stuck in like childhood um, modes and worldview for their entire life. That's why we have old mid, middle-aged men throwing hissy fits about things because actually they've been never been taught or shown the wisdom within their own tradition, their own spiritual heritage about how to grow up. And then the last one is show up. Um, all of us have got to learn how to show up and be present to our own life. Not just to like cycle through or follow through things um, without any conscious thinking, but to maybe stop and realize, okay, we need to uh, be present to our lives before they're over. But he does something really remarkable in here. 
he has uh, a number of things and he's really doing nothing more than trying to synthesize a number of different frameworks about spiritual and psychological and emotional and moral growth and put them all together and then say, how can these be supplemented alongside religion? Because most religions in the world were created about 2000 BC and then they developed and everything else, but some, some of them got kind of stuck. And so what he says is since then we've made some amazing discoveries such as uh, the universe is not geocentric. The universe doesn't circle around the earth, um, which by the way was not a Hebrew or Christian idea first. It was actually a Greek idea through, through Ptolemy. So actually stop blaming religious folk for thinking that the universe revolves around the earth. The Greeks came up with that first. But then we realized the world is actually heliocentric. And then we realized uh, the earth is round. It's not three-tiered like heaven, earth, hell. And so what he says is it's time to update, in some sense, the religions. And to integrate these newer sciences about the development of psychology and sociology and mathematics. And so what he's all about is having an integrative worldview that anchors religion as the main discipline for human growth. Now, I understand um, some people would say that religion has actually kept people back. It's not what he would say. He would just say that um, religion has been misunderstood. And as a result of being misunderstood, it has actually helped to regress and hold people back rather than propel them forward. And uh, I, this book is also emblematic of also learning about spiral dynamics, which has been fascinating and realizing that um, most of the issues that we deal with as humans are a result of our worldview and that every single one of us have to become aware of our uh, worldview because what our worldview is will influence what our values are and will absolutely influence the way we understand our own religion, the way we understand our own spiritual path. So in terms of theology, though, this has been helpful because I realized uh, theology and spirituality, if it's not integrative, it's really not helpful. And any form of spirituality or theology that negates or denies or represses or pushes aside other findings rather than incorporate and bring these things together is actually um, just like a child just trying to turn a blind eye to things. And that's not ever helpful for us to grow. So this book has been quite helpful in learning that human growth really is a priority for God and actually for all the spiritual traditions. Let me take another drink. Now, let me put these all back up here. These are fantastic books, of course, but they all deserve their own place. They all deserve um, to be studied and not rushed through. And I really would say that these are probably some of the most, well, not quite controversial, but definitely influential books that you could read and add to your own library. Now, I will say that these books are... <laughs> very difficult to synthesize. They approach life and God and theology and, and ethics in ways that do not always jive together. And it, it's almost like if you were to try to put all of these books into the same space, it's almost like you've got two or three different puzzles and all the pieces are together and you're trying to put all the pieces together. It's like, you know what? No, it, you just have three puzzles worked out or laid out here on this piece of paper or on this table. But life is too complex to make sense all the time. So why not have a whole variety of books that can help influence and shape and at least put you on a hopefully positive path, right? So we'll probably do something else similar to this at some point, but this was just the intro, the first of what maybe could be many. If you really enjoyed this, just let me know. And if you'd like to see a topic or maybe I could talk about something, 
just shoot me an email or, or just say something you'd like to like, well, I wonder what John would say about this. And maybe this could be the kickstart of some good stuff. All right. So thank you for checking this out. This is 12 books that have shaped my theology, but actually more than just theology, like spirituality, philosophy, mode of life, ethics, everything, which I guess is theology. Theology should influence everything else in life. So thank you for being here. This has been my first live stream. Hopefully it wasn't terrible and uh, maybe even a little bit entertaining. So we'll catch you later. Thank you. Hmm.